What's up guys, welcome back to the Left Lane Podcast, this is the Left Lane MMA channel, make sure to like and subscribe. Um, so we're going to be going through the MMA news, we're going to be talking all things MMA um, and discussing the topics um, that need to be discussed as well as answering a bunch of the viewer questions which I've got here. We've got We've selected 20 questions but first we're going to go over the 10 key topics which I've picked out since the last time we did one of these podcasts which was post for Z versus Gamrock card. So we've got three cards to go over and just a bunch of other MMA news and topics to discuss. So let's obviously start off with the most recent pay-per-view, um, UFC 294, Makachev versus Volkanovski. Um, and let's talk about Islam Makachev because that performance and that win was pretty incredible. Um, you can only give respect to him. You can, it's not, it's tough to talk about like, uh, 12 days notice or whatever, uh, didn't have enough camp. Like, yeah, Probably Volk would have done a lot better if he had preparation, but ultimately Islam put a close on it. That rehydration time he was able to really make good use of, um, and he did very well. Obviously, like in the clinch, it looked relatively even, but Islam was landing those knees. He knew what he needed to do. The knees were big, um, and that head kick at the end of it, he timed it, or he knew where to throw it. He knew that Volkanovski was defensively sound, but he knew that he was going to throw it right above right above his hand and right to the temple, and he knocked him out. Um, the second quickest lightweight title fight knockout in UFC history as well, which is pretty crazy. And in the space of 365 days, in the space of a year, he subbed Charles Oliveira. He went toe-to-toe with Volk in Perth um, and actually looked pretty solid in the striking. And then he just KO'd Volkanovski in the first round. So you can only give respect to Islam Makachev. His skills are... Pretty phenomenal, to be honest. I believe he's better than Khabib. I know a lot of people might say, like, recency bias, but, like, realistically, look at Khabib. His striking wasn't good. His technical striking was average at best. Um, and so I was never impressed with Khabib as a striker. He's grappling phenomenal. Probably a better grappler than Islam. More dominant. Got more wins with, like, the ground and pound and all of that. But Islam's striking is, like, actually top, like, three best at lightweight. Um, and you just couldn't say the same for Khabib. Khabib was always, you take the guy down, you sub him. Islam, his last three fights, he's basically won through the striking. Like, he KO'd Volk. He basically won the first fight through moments in the striking where he did better. Like, he dropped him in the first, all of that. And then he dropped Oliveira and then subbed him. Like, Islam's actually having his success with the striking. He almost goes to the grappling as a backup plan in some circumstances. Like, he didn't take down Volk in this fight. He didn't, like, it, it wasn't a fluke win. It's not like Volk was winning the whole fight and then Islam caught him with a shot. Like, he, it was just a pretty dominant, pretty clean performance. So, you can only really give credit to Islam. And I think his skills make him one of the harder guys to beat um, at lightweight. I'm sure there'll be a question uh, later on about who, how he goes against lightweights. But um, as far as that performance and that win, tough for Volkanovski, you know. But all respect goes to Islam. Let's talk about the pound-for-pound pound list, though, because um, it got released yesterday, obviously. After their first fight in February, it was marketed as number one versus two pound-for-pound, pound, winner becomes number one pound-for-pound. Pound. And then he didn't even go above Volk when he beat him, and then he went down another spot when Jones won. So he was number three pound-for-pound pound going into this fight. Um, but now he's KO'd Volkanovski, and he's still... Um, he's still number two pound for pound. He's not number one. Still, um, still not number one. John Jones retains that spot. Um, it's just pretty questionable, to be honest. Look, if you're if you're judging the pound for pound list based off like all time career resume, then obviously it's Jones. But I just don't think, given recent years, and Jones has only one win recently against Surreal Gunn, who isn't even in the pound for pound list. Um, I just don't know how he can be number one because Islam's beat Volk twice and Oliveira. Those are two top five or three, um, three top five pound for pound performances or wins. Um, then if you look at Volk, he's beaten. Um, he doesn't have any. Oh, he's beaten Max three times on the pound for pound list, so he actually does technically have the same. Leon's beat Usman twice. That's on the pound for pound list. Oliveira hasn't beat anyone on the list. Um, but he's got wins over three of the top five lightweights. Or four, sorry. Um, O'Malley's just beat Aljo. Strickland's beaten Izzy. Um, Izzy's beaten Pereira. Uh, 
Pereira's beat Strickland and Izzy and Blahovic as well. Um, then there's Pantoja. He's beaten like Moreno and stuff. None of them on the pound for pound list, which I think is surprising that Moreno was not like 15. Um, but he beat Moreno when he was on the pound for pound list, so that kind of counts. Um, Aljo, no wins currently on the pound for pound list. Um, Holloway, no current wins on the pound for pound list. Usman, um, no wins on the pound for pound list currently. Oh, he technically Leon ages ago. Yuri Pahaska, no wins on there. And then Jamal Hill, no wins on there. So that's the pound for pound list. Um, towards the end of it, I don't have a lot of dispute. I would have probably, I'm surprised that both Yuri and Jamal Hill are in there. I guess it's just because they want to have both of the guys here on the pound for pound list. I guess it makes more sense. Um, but honestly, I'm surprised there's not like maybe another heavyweight or like an, another middleweight guy like Drikus or something. Or maybe Marab or something on the pound for pound list. Like, I am pretty surprised on it. Or Gaethje at, like, number 15. I am kind of surprised that three of the spots are at light heavyweight, where it's a pretty shallow division. But I for sure think Islam, and I'm not even an Islam fan. I don't like the guy that much. Just his fan base pisses me off. But there's no doubt that, given his wins, he should be, um, recently, obviously, he should be pound for pound number one in my book. Um... But the loser of the main event was Alexander Volkanovsky. Um, he took a bad head kick knockout. He came in on short notice. Um, didn't look good in the fight in terms of like he looked in bad shape. Um, he didn't look overly quick. Like his reaction time wasn't sensational. Um, he looked solid in the clinch. He looked pretty strong in the clinch. Um, turned his arm around a little bit, but he wasn't like blocking the knees. Wasn't get blocking the body head body or head kicks. Um, and that's tough for him. But the, the bigger kind of thing that came out of that was not like, oh, Volk just got KO'd. It was like, Volk just got KO'd and is now talking about turning around to fight in January after a brutal KO loss against a power puncher in Ilya Teporia. And also post-fight, we find out he's really been suffering in the mental state recently. Um, I really don't like this for... Um, for Volkanovski, I don't think he is in the right state. Um, I'm not a fan of how he's looking. Um, like obviously in that fight, it's Islam. That's I'm not going to say Tapur is going to do that to Volk. Obviously, it's a completely different style matchup. But in terms of just your mental state, like it seems like he basically feels like he needs to fight and he needs to be in training camp to like feel like he's doing something or like feel good with himself. Um, so honestly, to me, that's not a good sign to see. That's not something which I'm like oh, this is a good mentality of a champion. Like, originally it was like, he wanted to go around and just smoke all the featherweight contenders. He's like, I'm just going to go smoke every single one of them and just conquer the whole division. But now it's like, he went up, he tried to conquer another division, failed twice, and he's now trying to go, and in his second chance, got KO'd badly, and now wants to fight again, less than 100 days later, three months later, in Canada. Um, it's just a terrible idea, to be honest. Like, Volkanovski is still an incredible fighter, like, it's not like he looked awful against Islam, like, it's not like he just got completely schooled on the feet, um, for five rounds, like, he got hit with a good shot, he was getting caught a bit with the body kicks beforehand, like, obviously, if you, I picked him to win, but that was more me going, like, I really want Volk to win, so can we just, like, kind of will this into existence, but if you looked at it logically, Volk was never going to win that fight, so... It is tough for Volk. Um, I do think pound for pound and skill wise, he is way better than Ilya Teporia, um, and he should beat him. But when you just can't, if you can't take a shot, then you can't win a fight. Like unless you just completely don't get hit ever. Like if you're getting rocked by, like he's just been KO'd by Islam. How am I going to trust him to take shots from Ilya Teporia in the pocket? Like I don't know. I think he should win. And like if this fight's happen, if this fight happens in March. I'm obviously going to pick Volk, but I'm not a fan of how he's trying to turn back around immediately. Like, maybe it turns out well for him. Maybe he kicks this loss and he just goes, nah, screw you guys, I'm back. Fuck you. Like, you guys doubted me. Um, but it could also go the complete opposite and then it ends up being a horrible decision and then it ends up on Volk going on a losing streak because he then tries to take a rematch with Ilya like three months later again and then he loses again. Like... This is how slides happen. This is how guys go downhill. It's when they try and chase their losses. It's the same thing that happens when you fucking go to the pokies, mate. You try and you try and win back the money you lost, you, you, and you just lose more. Like you try and make that get that win back, and it just doesn't end well for you. Um, 
So I'm, I'm worried for Volk, but I hope he can rebound. The next thing we got to talk about, obviously, the co-main event, Hamza Chamaya versus Kamaru Usman. Um, first of all, who do we think actually won the fight? How did this really go down? Like, Hamza came out, smoked him in the first round, like, dominated him, was absolutely ragdolling him on the ground. But then, second and third, he apparently might have hurt his hand or some shit like that. Still haven't got, like, an x-ray or anything, so we don't know. Maybe he just had a bit of a sore wrist, like, sprained his wrist or something like that. Um, but he gassed. He didn't, like, in the second round, he basically threw nothing. Um, and then when he was getting takedowns in the second and third round, he was kind of holding on for dear life, not attacking the same submissions or positions that he did in the first round, where he just went balls to the wall trying to finish Kamara Usman. Um, and I'm just not overly sold on how he's looked, like... I, I'm just not all that confident on um, how he's going to do against future middleweights. Like, Usman was coming in on, like, 10 days' notice, moving up a weight class, which he's never done before. Usman hasn't fought at um, middleweight before. Um, and he's coming in, and it's just, like, a bit iffy. Like, it's not the performance which we expected to see from Hamza Chemaev, Um given the opponent in front of him in terms of just the camp and the style. Like, you'd expect Usman to have a good camp for someone like for someone like Hamza to prepare for the takedowns, to prepare for what he's really going to do to him on the feet. But Usman kind of just rocked up how he always does. Got taken down, which was so impressive. The first, like, look, we could be talking about first round Hamza as, like, the best fighter in UFC history. Because I don't see anyone that wins a first round against Hamza Chemaev. But when you're then looking at the second and third, like, or, or second, third, or even fourth and fifth as you're getting into those championship fights, you just can't be gassing out. You can't be not able to hold a pace for five rounds. Like, you not, you need to be able to go at the same pace for the whole time. Like, cool, you ba you banked the first round, but against someone who's a bit better than Usman or a bit more prepared, that first round's not going to mean shit. Like, okay, maybe you get a 10-8, but in a title fight, like, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but... Um, Sean Strickland, like, imagine you smoke him in the first round, like, you've got four more to go, if you can't win another round there, you're cooked, you're gonna get either TKO'd, or you're gonna get, you're gonna lose a decision, so, Hamza Chemaev really needs to work on his pacing, he needs to work on how he goes about using his cardiovascular system in fights, because if, if, if you cannot hold that pace, like, if you cannot just go balls to the wall for five rounds, then don't do it, it like, there's no point in smoking someone in the first round, but then you got nothing left for the second and third. So maybe he needs to just tune it back, just attack some takedowns and not work all that crazy grappling where you're going to have to, you're working to keep the guy down. Just kind of hold him there for a bit. Like, if that's the pace you have to go at, just be a wet blanket. Like, look, first round Hamza, super entertaining, super dangerous, but he turns into a wet blanket in the second and third. So he really needs to even out that cardio, figure out what he's going to do there. Um, as for Kamara Usman, like, in that fight, he actually looked pretty solid. He came out there, he looked good with the striking in the second and third. He was kind of schooling Hamza around a bit with a jab. Um, and he didn't look too bad. So Usman's definitely um, got... He's definitely not on the way out. Like, those Leon fights, he didn't look great. But I think that's, that third Leon fight, that trilogy, was probably a bit more attributed to a bit of the nerves with that head kick. Um, again, that's something I'm worried for with Volk. Like, he's just a bit more hesitant. It was like it was actually a really similar scenario. Um, like Leon head kicked him, and then in the, that fight, the leg kicks and the body kicks were big. Um, so that's something I'm worried about for Volk in the future. But regardless, Usman looked solid. He's going back down to 170 most likely. I wouldn't mind seeing him at middleweight again. Um, like I think there's a lot of guys he can beat. But probably go down to welterweight after that performance. I look before this fight. I actually was probably I would have probably picked Bilal to beat him. Now, I'm honestly, like, he could honestly still be a top, like, top two, top three fighter in middleweight. And now, he might not be the guy that just gets ran over by Shavkat to give him a title shot. Like, now, he might actually be the guy to turn back a few of these up-and-comers. Like, he would be there in Gary right now. He beat Jack Delamada. Like, he would beat these guys right now. Maybe not Shavkat, I'm not sure. But, Usman's um, looking not too bad. Not too bad for Kamara Usman. Um, but, obviously, the... The main, like, kind of future fight that's kind of been presented coming off this fight with um, Kamara Usman for Hamzat is the Sean Strickland matchup. And there's a lot of debate as to who people believe would win this fight. Obviously, the only way to find out is to see him go at it in the squared circle. But um, 
Kamar Usman versus Hamza Chamaev. Who do you guys think would win? Let me know in the comments. I would honestly pick Sean Strickland because I think Sean Strickland's defensive grappling is pretty solid. He really doesn't get submitted or dominated in the grappling that much. He stays calm. He's got a way better cardio um, cardio than Hamza Chamaev. And I think he probably gets ragdolled around in the first, but just stays calm, stays out of danger, doesn't get choked out. And then I think he probably goes on to just wear on Hamza, put a jab in his face and just piss him off. And he beats the hell out of Hamza in the striking exchanges. That's a fact. There's no way Hamza beats Sean Strickland on the feet. His striking in the Burns fight and the Usman fight have shown to be pretty average, honestly. Like, he's obviously, he is pretty new to MMA, so he can definitely improve. But it's not like Sean Strickland's a 35-year-old champion. Like, I'm pretty sure he's 32. He's not even, like, close to out of his prime yet for Sean Strickland. Like, I really do see... Hamza Chamaev takes him down in the first. Everyone's like, oh, the live odds swell out to like minus 800 for Hamza. They're like, oh, he's dominating him. And then Sean just puts the pace on him. And then Hamza can't go to those takedowns as easily. The takedowns he shoots in the third and fourth rounds just get stuffed. And Sean just has his way with him. Uses him as a punching bag and could arguably get a finish depending on how badly Hamza does fade away. Um, so I would honestly lean towards Sean Strickland in that matchup. But you guys let me know who you would pick. Um, the other side of it is Kamara Usman. I'll talk briefly about him too. Um, his future. So, middleweight is a possibility. Welterweight's a possibility. Like, if you look at both of those divisions, I think there's a lot of guys he beats. I'm not going to go through all of them right now because there's a question on that that someone's asked. Um, but I definitely think Usman could be like a top five middleweight and still is a top three or something welterweight. Like, Covington fight would really be interesting, a trilogy. I wouldn't say that would be one-sided either way. Um, I do think he would obviously lose again if he fought Leon, but like Bilal's a close fight. Burns is another probably maybe even beats Burns. Like Shavkat, there's a debate there. Like he could beat Shavkat. Um, so Usman's future is pretty promising. I genuinely think, look, he's probably not going to stick around for a hell of a lot longer. He is technically now on a three fight losing streak, but, um, I think he can still stick around. I think we'd probably see Usman for a year or two more. Um, and I think he just is that guy that probably will just beat up a few of the up-and-comers and maybe retire in a Legends fight against, like, I don't know, Wonderboy Thompson or something like that if he doesn't retire against Shavkat. Like, I don't know. Usman, I think he can stick around. I'm, I have a bit of hope for him. And I wouldn't mind seeing him do the middleweight thing again on a full camp. Like, bulk yourself up to middleweight. See how you go. Because honestly, that fight five rounds or on a full camp, Usman's looking a lot better in the later rounds. So... That's really interesting to me. But we'll quickly recap the rest of UFC 294. Johnny Walker and Magomed Ankalaev ended in some referee slash doctor stupidity when Un Ankalaev need him as a grounded opponent. Illegal, completely illegal. Intentional strike, mind you. Not unintentional. I don't know how it was a no contest. But the doctor's asking Johnny Walker some riddles or some shit. He's asking him to solve some long division problems, I must have been, because he wasn't happy with his answer and he got the fight called off. So... Them two went at it a little bit. They were kind of um, trying to get to each other in the cage. Everything went a bit crazy. Cooled down. Um, they'll probably rebook that fight for later this year or early next year, maybe as a fight night main event. Um, uh, also on the card, Ikram Alaskarov looked really good. He is definitely someone to watch in the future. He beat up Wally Alvarez in the first round. Saeed Nabagamedov wrapped up that signature guillotine, putting himself back in the bantamweight top 15. Um, Muhammad Makayev battled through some adversity, losing the first two rounds to Tim Elliott and got that comeback submission in the third as he does. Um, we had Trevor Peak actually use some decent fight IQ and win a pretty clear decision over Muhammad Yaya. Um, Anshul Jubilee forgot how to defend strikes against Mike Breeden. Um, Ottoman Azai, no, Abu Azaita and Cedricus Dumas had a pretty average fight which went to the way of Cedricus Dumas. Um, Javid Basharat made Victor Henry infertile, and then that same doctor basically claims to Victor Henry that he wasn't kicked in the balls. Um, what else did we have? Nathaniel Wood got kind of robbed of a decision based on a lot of cheating done from the side of Naimov. Um, badly cheated in that fight. Um, we had Victoria Dudakova win a boring decision, then announced to the world that she went into the fight with staff. Um, not sure why. And then we had Shara Putin Magomedov open up the card with an impressive striking display and a less than impressive grappling performance as he was 
um, beating up Bruno Silva on the feet, but got taken down and held there for moments at a time um, during their contest. So that was UFC 294. It was a pretty average card, honestly. I'd say like a 5, 6 out of 10. But let's talk. Let's go back to a few of the other cards. Edson Barboza just last weekend um, showed a veteran performance against Sadiq Yusuf and looked actually really good in that fight. After a really rough first round where he got pretty much 10 aided and beat up in the first round, he came back um, and used that veteran experience. He was landing the shots, he was figuring out his range, not getting cracked with the boxing, which has always been a kind of weakness of his, is he kind of gets a bit too inside the pocket and gets caught with the hands. Um, he was landing that spinning kick, landing the kicks to the body, leg kicks, all of that, and a really impressive performance. Also on that card, other highlights, Martinez beat up the legs of Adrian Yanez, Michelle Pereira um, walked out with an Israel flag and then proceeded to KO um, Andre Petroski in just over a minute. Cameron Simon and Rodriguez had a great fight, which probably could have gone the other way if um, both fighters had ended up making weight. Uh, Christian Rodriguez needs to sort his weight out. Um, a few other good fights on there, you know, but it, another average apex card. Um, we'll talk about, obviously, the week before, Bobby Green got a good winner, uh, upset win, crazy stuff over Grant Dawson, turned back that sort of prospect. Um, in the co-main event, Joe Pfeiffer absolutely ran through Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. Um, also on the card, Buckley beat up Alex Morono for three rounds. Drew Dober um, made it past his racial motivations and uh, forced himself to beat up a white, a white man. Um, we had Kutalaba vs. Linz got cancelled, which was unfortunate. Bill Aljo schooled, kind of just out, schooled Hernandez on the feet. Um, but that, that was a solid card too. We've had some pretty solid cards recently. Um, shit's been good for the UFC, you know. Like, these Apex cards have actually been not too bad. They've been not, they've been, like, quietly stacked with just decent unranked fighters, you know. Um, so, pretty happy with that. Bobby Green, though, again, let's just talk about that for a second. Like, 33 seconds of action. Grant Dawson, he just got caught, bang, put him out. And now he's fighting Dan Hooker in a main event, which is a bit questionable. Um, but a great fight, but no, main event is what I mean as questionable, not the fight happening. Um, but those have been the recent cards. And now, final topic I have to talk about is the middleweight division. Um, shit's actually really good. I'm planning on making a, um, a well-constructed, completely serious um, and very informative PowerPoint presentation on uh, on ranking the best divisions from worst to best um, So is something I plan on doing. Um, that's a video coming out soon. And middleweight, I'll just give you a little bit of a hint. It's probably going to be in the top four. Um, you can figure out where it goes from there. But I'm definitely going to make that video pretty soon. But the middleweight is actually really solid. Like, all it took was fucking Israel Adesanya to not be champion. And then we have a good division now. It's actually crazy how that works. Um, because now we got new contenders, we got Hamzad in the division, we got Drikus looking for a title shot, Izzy's taking some time off, um, Kananir, like, you know, um, Costa, Whitaker, got all those names that have been there for a while, and then we got the up-and-comers, though, like, we got guys like Ikram, Bo Nickel, um, uh, Joe Pfeiffer, Roman Kopilov, Anthony Hernandez is kind of making a bit of a run, uh, Kaya Baraglio, and the Sultan was above, you know, these kind of guys. Like, we've got some really good prospects coming up in the middleweight division. Um, so, I, I rate the division super highly right now, and I actually expect it to climb even higher as certain divisions kind of become a bit stale with just a lack of fresh matchups, you know. So, I think we're going to see some really good stuff happen at middleweight in the future, and it's definitely one of my favorite divisions in the sport right now. Look, am I going to say it's the best division in the sport? Am I going to say that... I'm looking forward to middleweight fights over, like, lightweight fights every single day of the week. Probably not, but in terms of the future of the division, it's actually pretty promising, and I look forward to seeing guys like Ikram and Roman Kopilov in the rankings, Bo Nickel, obviously. Um, these guys, I think, all make the rankings um, within the next couple of years, so middleweight's looking really solid. But that is the topics that we've gone over in today's podcast, but... We, we move to the people now. We go to the questions, and I've got 20 of them. I've picked out the best ones. Um, be sure to leave more questions in the comments. The comments on the YouTube videos, um, if you leave them there, they're going to be more likely to get read. I'll, I'll pick them first. So ask your questions away in the comments, and let's start off. The first question, are we witnessing the beginning of Volkanovski's decline? How do you think a quick turnaround to fight to Poirier in January will impact his chances? Um, 
exactly what I was talking about before. Do I think Volkanovski is on the decline? Maybe. Do I think he is probably at his exact peak right now? No, but you only have to go one fight back to see that that the performance against Yaya Rodriguez was otherworldly impressive. And before that, he went toe-to-toe with Islam, who just dominated him. But, like, those two performances, and, and then before that, he schooled Holloway. Like, Volkanovski is a fucking incredible fighter. Like, he is so good. Um, but this KO, I think, before this fight, I wouldn't have said he's on the decline at all. I'm like, he's still going. But after this, I'm like, not like he looked terrible. He just got hit with a good shot. But now I do think we're probably going to start to see him go down. I think we're going to see the fight with Tapoya. I think he's still going to win. But I think he's going to really have to fight tooth and nail for it and probably win like three rounds to two. Um, but that after that is where I think he probably goes down. If he takes another fight with a bunch of damage and like gets cracked up in the pocket and stuff, then that's where I see Volkanovski start to probably wither away a little bit and just not put on those same beating performances that he used to. Um, and if he fights Tapoya in January, it's a risky one. And I honestly would be like, I wouldn't tell you you're dumb for thinking Tapoya is going to catch him and put him away. Um, but the next question is, um, who is the worst matchup stylistically for Marab aside from Aljo? And then also, um, how do the matchups between Garn, Aspinall, and Pavlovich go? Okay, so worst matchup for Marab apart from Aljo, I would actually go with someone like maybe a Cejudo, maybe a, even Corey Soundhagen. I wouldn't mind just because I think he's actually really improved in the grappling. Um, Song Yudong is another guy who I think would give Marab problems. Just those guys that get back up to the feet and just use explosiveness to just get away really quickly. The guys that aren't going to just stay and just get clinched up um, and who can compete with him in the physical strength. So obviously, Sandagan's not going to compete with the physical strength, but out of Cejudo, him, and Song Yudong, I think he's definitely the best striker. Song Yudong is a guy who I see him utilizing like explosiveness and quick, like powerful movements to get back up and just ripping tight hooks to the body against Marab. But I want to see him back in there. I think the rumors are he's fighting Cejudo. That's something that's going around. So we'll see what happens there. And then your other part was Garn, Aspinall, and Pavlovich. I think Aspinall beats Garn. I think Pavlovich beats Aspinall and Garn. And yeah, I, 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 I think Garn is not in the right headspace from MMA in comparison to the other two. I don't think he cares about it as much. He's working the grappling a little bit, but I think Pavlovich catches him on the end of a few shots and wobbles him around a little bit. Um, and I think Aspinall would just outgrapple Cyril Garn. And then I think Pavlovich would catch Aspinall and he, as he gets a little bit too wild in the pocket. Maybe catch him with a hook, but good questions. Next one. Um, in what order do you think the champions of every division will lose their belts? Um, and how many title defenses do you think they'll have before, they, before, before then? All right, so... Um, heavyweight, I think John Jones is actually going to be the first champion to go away, not lose his belt. I think he's going to beat Stipe and retire. So John Jones gets one title defense. Um, light heavyweight has no champ. Middleweight, I think Strickland, um, I think he gets like two or two title defenses. I honestly believe because I think he would beat Strick. I think he would beat um Hamza, and I wouldn't actually mind him to beat Drukas Duplessis. So he could get even more, but it just depends, you know. Like Strickland, he could. Um, well to wait, I think Leon Edwards gets, I think, one or two more defenses. I think he beats Covington, but even that, he could lose his belt. I think he beats Covington, um, and then I think if he fights Bilal, I think he would definitely win that. But if he fights Shavkat straight after that, I think he could lose. So maybe one for Leon, but maybe two as well. Lightweight, Islam Makhachev, you know, I think he loses the belt on his own accord. I do believe he can help hold on to it for as long as he wants, I think. When he loses it, it is probably in a in a permanent move to welterweight after the weight cut gets too hard. Um, I think he would just be like, fuck it, let's just move up and then probably drop it, like regardless of if he wins or loses. Um, but I think Oliveira is the one guy that might beat him. But apart from that, like right now, I don't see anyone else beating him. I don't see Gaethje beating him, Poirier, Dayush, like um, any of those guys. I just don't see them beating Islam Makhachev. I think he's the one that... If he stays at lightweight, he holds the belt for the longest. Um, featherweight. Okay, if Volk loses to Tapoya, then obviously that answers your question. But if he gets past Tapoya, I see him winning as many as he needs to. Because now he's not going to go back up to lightweight. That's going to be out of the picture. So I think 
Arnold Allen's fighting Movzai Evluev in January. If they do Volk vs. Tapoya on that card, and he beats Tapoya, then I think they'll just give him the winner regardless, just because he'll want a fight. And I think he would beat either of those guys. So if Volk gets past Tapoya, I think he holds the belt until he either just falls off a cliff, or until he just decides to retire. So I think Volk, along with Islam, could actually be a long reign, another, like, keep his belt for a while. So I think Volk gets, like, four, three or four more defences, but that's assuming he gets past Tapoya and doesn't go on, like, a real bad decline. Um, at Bantamweight, I think O'Malley loses his fight, loses after one fight. I think they're going to give him Cheeto. I think he's going to kind of outclass Cheeto on the feet for five rounds. Um, and then I think he would lose to Marab. I think he would lose to Corey Sandhagen. I think he would lose to these kind of guys. But if they just give him select style matchups, then they, he could probably hold on to it for a bit. And I think Pantoja is another guy who can hold on to his belt for a hot minute. I think he beats Roy Val. I think he would beat either Moreno or El Barzi, because I think those two should be fighting. I think that's probably going to happen. Um, he beats the winner of that. I think he would beat Manel Cap in a rematch. I think he would beat Mikhaev, obviously, in the future. Like, Flyweight's not a super deep division. It doesn't have a lot of, like, real promising up-and-comers where I'm like, geez, that guy could win. I think Pantoja gets, like, four more title defenses, honestly. I think that we could see something like that. Um, so that's that question done. Um, next one. How do you think Usman versus Hamza would have turned out if Hamza had a... So if Usman had a full training camp to prepare and bulk up? I honestly think... Full camp, Usman beats him, and also five rounds, even on the 12 days notice, I think Usman beats him. Um, I just didn't see enough from Hamzad in the cardio department or in the striking to think that if Usman had more time to prepare, especially in a rematch, I think Usman would win. Um, and just the time to prepare like for that striking, like if he knew what to do, he would like he kind of just rocked up, put a jab two together, um, and kind of schooled Hamzad a little bit on the feet, honestly. Um, so I definitely would go with uh, Kamara Usman in a rematch, and or, or if it was five rounds, or if he had time to prepare. Um, next question. What matchup would you like to see next for Shara Bullet? Um, and how far do you think he's going to make it at middleweight? So Shara Bullet's next fight, I say you go another unranked opponent. You could go a can to, like, I, th- I see you go GM3 maybe. You could do a GM3 fight, maybe Tavares, um one of those guys just outside the rankings, like, if Maniz loses to, um, Iron Turtle in December, you book that fight, I could, I could see that, but that's a grapple, you kind of want to give him a couple strikers first, I wouldn't mind a Roman Kopilov fight, um, but they're probably going to give him a few easier fights, just to get his name up a bit, put him on a few pay-per-views, like, pre- headline prelims, maybe, um, I think he makes it, like, to the top, like, 15, and then I think he probably loses to grapplers, and then he kind of just floats around, he'll probably make the top 10, because eventually they'll give him a top 10 opponent who's a striker, and who he can just outstrike, um, but I ultimately do think that he would lose to all of the grapplers at the top of middleweight. The next question, um, what is each division's gatekeeper missing to make it past gatekeeper status in their game? So, Curtis Blades, I believe, is the gatekeeper at, um, heavyweight, and I think he's missing fight IQ and correct game planning. I think he goes into all of his fights with the wrong attitude. He's struck with Pavlovich, um, and then he wrestles with guys that he doesn't need to wrestle with. Like, he just needs to, he needs to know his strengths, you know? Um, okay, so light heavyweight, I think the, the gatekeeper is Anthony Smith, um, and for him to stop being a gatekeeper, he needs to, uh, stop getting his family attacked. Um, no, nah, Anthony Smith, you know, it's tough. I don't think he's going to improve. He's getting older, so it's. I'm not going to kind of come to a solution and say, look, Anthony Smith can come back this fucking revitalized version, rejuvenated fighter, and just be a champion. Like, that's not going to happen. Um, I don't know, maybe, like, get some better defense, work. He needs to get better leg kick defense, too. He gets his legs cooked in fights. Uh, middleweight, gatekeeper, I was going to say Brunson, but that's gone now, so maybe, like, a Vittori... Um, could be the gatekeeper there, Vittori just needs to stop being an oaf, and just like, get good in one area, and just push like, um, stop absorbing shots with your chin, um, I actually don't know who the gatekeeper is at middleweight though, you know, because before Strickland came champ, after Brunson retired, I would have said Strickland, but, um, honestly, Strickland's the gatekeeper, fuck it, he's the gatekeeper to the title, um, 
Welterweight, the gatekeeper's Magni. Let's be real. Magni needs to stop being a boring fuck that just clinches and beats his kids. <laughs> uh, that, that's what Ian Gary will tell you. But yeah, Neil Magni, you know, needs to work some more effective grappling. You know, maybe work some offensive submissions. Um, all that kind of stuff. Lightweight, the gatekeeper. you got to almost say, like, it depends. Like, could you call Dayush a gatekeeper, maybe? No, nah, you can't really call Dayush. Maybe, like, Dan Hooker's a gatekeeper. He needs to stop absorbing shots with his chin um, and be more technical, I guess, on the feet. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, I'd say Dan Hook is the lightweight gatekeeper. Uh, featherweight gatekeeper is probably... I mean, the gatekeeper to the belt is Max Holloway. And what he needs to do is just be better. Um, but another gatekeeper... Like Josh Emmett, actually. Josh Emmett's the gatekeeper. But another gatekeeper... Like Josh Emmett, actually. Josh Emmett's the gatekeeper. He needs to put some technique behind his shots. Um, stop just throwing looping overhands, you know, ch stick a jab out there, be a bit more defensive. Um, uh, Bantamweight, the gatekeeper, is probably uh, Rob Font, I would say. Rob Font's the, yeah, Rob Font's the gatekeeper of Bantamweight, I would, I would say right now. Um, he needs to get some takedown defense, um, and he needs to get a better chin. Do some of that chin conditioning, you know. Um, I'd say, yeah, I'd say Rob Font's the gatekeeper at Bantamweight. They'll let me know if you guys disagree. And then Flyweight, the gatekeeper, I would say, is Alex Perez. Um, and he needs to just stop being shit. There's not really anything Alex Perez is going to do to make himself a top-level fighter. Maybe Kai Kai France, you could kind of say, is a gatekeeper, but not really. Um, like, for me, the gatekeeper guys is, like, the ones that beat a few of the up-and-comers. And then they also have a few fights where they just get smoked. And then the guys that beat them go on to, like, fight for a title or something like that. So, that, that I'd say those are the gatekeepers. Interesting question, though. Um, with how both fighters performed on short notice, how does Usman and Hamza do against the top 15 in middleweight? So, yeah, I was anticipating this question. That's why I didn't go through it before. But we'll do Hamza first. I think he beats Hernandez. Um, he beats Chris Curtis. He beats Paul Craig through probably even the striking, honestly. Uh, he beats Amavov, beats Gastelum, beats Allen, beats Hermanson. Delizzi's tough. He probably beats him on the feet, though. I think he would beat Costa, beats Vittori. Cannoneer, I think, is tough. I think he could lose that fight because I don't think he finishes Cannoneer in the first. Um, I think he loses to Drickus as well. I think he beats Izzy, ragdolls him in the first. Izzy's not going to have the same defensive wrestling or subs as Kamara Usman. And then I think he loses to Strickland and gets cardioed. So. And then for Usman, sorry, beats Hernandez, beats Chris Curtis, beats Paul Craig, beats Amavov. Beats Gastelum Allen. I think he beats Hamzad in a rematch. Beats Hermanson. Beats Dalizzi. Beats Costa. Beats Vittori. I think he'd lose to Cannonier. He's a bit too powerful. I think he'd lose to Drickus. I think he would potentially beat Izzy. But I think Izzy would stuff the takedown. So I'd lose to Izzy and lose to Strickland. Good question though. Um, the next one is... Uh, kicks to the nuts. A new cheat code to gain an advantage um, in MMA. Yeah, honestly... Kick, just cheat in MMA. Kick kick people in the nuts. Grab the cage. Hold on to the gloves. Fucking pull their hair like Abu Azaita. Um, It's actually... And I know you're talking about the Victor Henry fight here, but honestly, it's like the Nathaniel Wood versus Muhammad Naimov is the biggest example of why you don't get punished for cheating in MMA. Like, just cheat and you'll be fine. Um, they, you get like fucking five warnings before they take a point. So just don't do the same thing twice in a row, and then you're sweet. Like, if you just rotate it around, like, kick them in the nuts, poke them in the eye, grab the cage, and then you cycle back through again. Then you can poke them in the eye back again. Like, you can literally just cheat, and you don't get points taken half the time. Um, based off the incredible performance against Volk in the rematch, and defending his belt twice, how do you see Islam doing against the top 15 of welterweight, do you see him becoming a double champ? Anyone in the lightweight division as a threat? So, I've got my welterweight rankings right here. And Islam Makachev, he would beat Renat. He would beat Kiesa. He would beat Magni. He'd beat Holland. He would beat Della. Beat Gary. Beat Luke. Beat Brady. Beat Jeff Neal. Beat Wonderboy. Um, I think he would probably beat Shavkat. We haven't seen enough of Shavkat yet. I think he would beat... Burns is tough. I think he's way better on the feet, though, honestly. If you'd asked before the Volk fight, I would have said uh, Burns. I think Hum oh, sorry, Covington, I think he's just better than him on the feet. Um, Bilal, I think he beats, to be honest. Uh, Usman, I think he's tough, but I think seeing Hamzat, I think Usman, uh, uh, Islam can out-grapple him. Um, and I also think he's better on the feet. And then Leon, um, 
I think he can actually take down, you know, and I think on the feet, it's actually a pretty even fight. So I honestly think Islam could definitely become a double champ. And at lightweight, I think Oliveira is the only guy that is realistically a threat to him right now. Maybe another guy like, I don't know, Bonar St. Denis comes up and keeps smoking people. But as of right now, I say Oliveira is the only guy that could beat Islam. Gaethje could, of course, just catch him. Um, and then I think he can def I think he beats most of the guys at welterweight. Um, the next question, how do you think a fight between Holloway and Aljo would go? Um, I'd pick Holloway in that fight. I think his defensive grappling is pretty solid, and I don't think Aljo would be as much of just a grappling threat um, as he was at Bantamweight. I think Holloway would be strong enough to kind of fend off some takedowns. Um, and I think he would just piece him up on the feet. I'd put it, he'd just really mess him up with the boxing on the feet. Um, next question. How does Prime Tony, Khabib, and McGregor all do against the top current lightweights? Um, okay, so... We'll start with Prime Tony. He beats Dober. He beats Frivola, maybe, but he could just get cracked, you know. He beats Moicano, beats Bobby Green, beats Jalen Turner, beats RDA, beats Dan Hooker, loses to Armin, loses to Fazeev, beats Gamrot, beats Chandler, beats Dayush, loses to Poirier, loses to Gaethje, loses to Oliveira, loses to Islam. Okay, Khabib beats Dober, Frivola, Moicano, Green, Turner, RDA, Hooker, Armin, Fazeev, Gamot, Chandler, Dayush, Poirier, Gaethje. Oliveira's close. I would probably say he gets it done with the grappling. And then he would lose to Islam. And then Connor um, beats prime Connor. So Connor that fought Alvarez. He beats Dober, beats Favola, beats Moicano, beats Green, Turner, RDA, Hooker. Loses to Armin. Loses to Fazeev. Loses to Gamot through the grappling. Uh, beats Chandler, the current Chandler he beats, uh, probably loses to Dayush through the wrestling, uh, Prime Connor probably beats current Poirier, loses to Gaethje, loses to Oliveira, loses to Islam. Good stuff. Um, another question we've got, how does Sean Strickland fare against the top 15 of middleweight? So, back one second, let me get my top 15 middleweights. Okay, so Sean Strickland, um, Beats Hernandez, beats Chris Curtis, beats Paul Craig, beats Amavov, beats Gastelum, beats Allen. I think he beats Hamzat, beats Hermanson, beats Dalidzi, beats Costa, beats Vittori, beats Cannonier in a close decision, beats Drickus, I believe. I think he just gets him on the feet. I think he beats Izzy in a rematch. You know what? I know I said Strickland might lose immediately, and he could lose to Hamzat. I think out of those guys, Hamzat and Drickus are the two toughest fights for him. But apart from that, you know, I honestly think Strickland beats everyone else at middleweight. Um, next question. Volk versus the top five at lightweight. So, Volkanovski loses to Islam again. Uh, I think after that, he would lose to Oliveira. Loses to Gaethje. I could see him beating Poirier, maybe. And then I think he beats Dayush as the top five lightweight. And then if he can't outside, because technically Islam's champ. And then I think he would beat Chandler. Um... Next question. How do you see these matchups playing out? Gaethje versus Gamrot. I would take Gaethje to just stuff the takedowns and just beat the fuck out of him on the feet. Um, Poirier versus Sayukin. I would go with um, Sayukin. Right now, I think he would manage to do a little bit better. Um, win across three rounds. Uh, Gaethje versus Sayukin. I still think Gaethje would win. I think he can just stuff these takedowns, you know, and I think Gaethje's actually really good. And then Poirier versus Gamrot. I think they don't. They wouldn't fight because they train together. But I think Poirier would just get it done. I think he'd stuff enough of the takedowns. Um, okay, next one. Where do you see these fighters' careers five years from now? Conor McGregor retired. He'll retire. Um, Hamza Shamayev. I think he'll be a top five middleweight, maybe a champion. Maybe he's probably won the belt at this point. Um, just floating around the top five. Um, Paddy Pimlet's gonna have like just drifted off to obscurity, and no one will care about him anymore. Um, because he's going to take a few losses, and he'll just become an un unranked fighter that just is always on like the main card of like Apex Fight Nights. And Sean Strickland, I think, will be slightly on his way out, still around that top five-ish to seven kind of area. Um, still kind of be just main eventing Apex cards, just winning fights there. Next one, if Alex beats Yuri, then Jamal Hill, and then let's say Johnny Walker, and then retires. Where does that put him light heavyweight all time, and then also UFC overall? Okay, so light heavyweight all time, he's not gonna—he's gonna be number two probably, or maybe number three behind DC, because that would be 
that would be two title defenses, and then wins over Yuri Hill and Yuri Hill Walker and Blahovich. So three of those are title uh, former former champions. Um, so if he did that, I would say he's like two or three light heavyweight all time. And you know what? He could honestly have an argument to being top ten um, all time if he had uh, if he wins the belt at middleweight, also with a win over Sean Strickland, and then has three wins over former champions at light heavy, uh, three wins over former light heavyweight champs and two defenses. Um, you know what? That's actually maybe not top ten, but that's close. You know. Because people rate DC for defending in two divisions. Obviously, he didn't defend a middleweight, but um, especially with another with that win over Izzy, if he beats Izzy again, maybe I don't know. Like that, that's crazy if he could do that. And I can see it honestly because I think he beats Jamal Hill and Johnny Walker. Um, okay, next question: Who would win, Makachev versus Covington and Makachev versus Edwards? So I kind of went over this before. I think Makachev versus Covington. I don't think he gets taken down by Covington. I think the cardio Covington would definitely be better. But I think he beats him on the feet, you know. I think he cracks him, maybe even finishes him uh, with strikes. And then Edwards, I think, is a really close back-and-forth fight where he probably gets a bit better at the grappling exchange. I think he does kind of get minorly outstruck on the feet against Edwards. Um, but, yeah. So, I think he beat, I think he wins both. Next one. Uh, if Islam fought Usman in his prime at 170, how would it have gone? So, Prime Usman, I do think, would beat um, would beat Islam. Because I think Prime Usman would almost even be able to have success with the grappling against Islam. And I think on the feet, he's def- he was defensively pretty solid. Um, and the Islam's like, style of striking would not be the same against Volk uh, and Oliveira as it would be against Usman. Um, so, I think Usman wins a really close split decision. He kind of five rounds fight uh, where he kind of gets a bit of clinch control. Um... Next one. Should fighters lose their rank for inactivity? Brian Ortega hasn't won since 2020 and is still in the top three at 145. Um, I completely agree with you. I think I've talked about this before. Um, he should be removed from the rankings. I think fighters that haven't fought in the last like year and a half should be removed from rankings unless it's because of an injury. Like I know Ortega had an injury, but if they have no wins over current ranked fighters then I think he should be removed. And then you just come back in when you fight again. But what, what's the... Or just move down. Keep moving. Don't, like, kick him out like that. But, like, keep him, like, moving. Just, just progressively move down every time. Like, every month, you just move down. Um, next question. Um, we'll finish on these... Pr- these are the last, last questions. So we'll finish on these prime uh, or fantasy matchups. Bilal versus Kamaru and Shavkat at 170. I think Bilal would lose to both. Um... Colby versus Shavkat, I think Shavkat would do just enough. I think he would um, be better on the feet, and I don't think he gets taken down. And then Yair versus Tapoya or Kelvin Cater. I think Yair against Tapoya, I think he could act. I think Yair beats Tapoya, you know. After watching Jai Herbert crack um, crack Tapoya with a head kick, that's Jai Herbert. I do definitely believe that Yair, with those kicks, would get in there and cause Tapoya some issues. Um, but he could just get taken down. And then Yair versus Kelvin Cater. I think Yair just pieces him up with kicks. I think Yair versus um, Cater is how we thought uh, Cater versus Giga was going to go. Except Yair actually has cardio and can hold that pace for the whole time. Um, But ladies and gentlemen, those are all the questions. That's the podcast done. Thank you for listening. Um, If you could like the video, that would be appreciated. Leave a comment if you've got another question for the next podcast. Even if you don't have a question, just leave a comment. Leave a W or something in the comments. Boost the algorithm, you know. Trying to get these numbers up. Trying to get these views. I'd love to hit 100 subs by the end of the year. That would be sick. Um, But ultimately, thank you for listening. Um, Hope you enjoyed the podcast. And I'll see you guys in the next one, which will be a um, ranking the divisions from worst to best PowerPoint video. So, see you guys. Peace out.